I'm Monica Kuhnreds, Executive Director of the Rett Syndrome Research Trust. I'm at the University of Virginia to speak with members of the Kipnis Lab. Noel Derecki, Jim Cronk, and Jonathan Kipnis about their publication published online on March 18th in the journal Nature. I'd like to start by congratulating each one of you um, on your Nature publication. I've um, been following your RET experiments, I think, practically from day one, sometimes on a daily basis, and it's been a truly unique um, and interesting experience. So you are a lab of neuroimmunologists, which means you study the intersection between the nervous system and the immune system. When visitors come to your lab website, the first thing that they see is the following text. Our motto is, rationalists do it by the rules, empiricists do it to the rules. We proudly admit to being empiricists because doing risky and sometimes crazy experiments is what we believe moves science forward. I like that, and I, I think I share that philosophy. Um, the Rett Syndrome Research Trust has not shied away from funding risky experiments. Doing bone marrow transplants in Rett mice will be thought of, I think, by some as rather far-fetched. So Dr. Kipnis, and if you don't mind, I'm going to call you Yanni because that's what I usually call you. Yanni, what made you come at Rett from this particular angle? Well, let me start from my past. I was really lucky to be trained with one of the great neuroimmunologist, um, Professor Michal Schwartz at the Weizmann Institute. And so when I joined their lab, they were working on the role of immune cells in the injured CNS, injured central nervous system. Then I took over this project and we, we took it later into more how T cells are helping animals deal with the stressful responses. And so one day reading, uh, reading about the red syndrome, uh, it looked to me very similar to how our immune deficient or T cell and B cell deficient mice do. And so I thought, what if immune system plays some role in, in some of the aspects of this disease? And that's how we came to this uh, crazy idea. We said, what if we fix the immune system? Uh, will we have any effect on the progression of the disease? Yanni, can you please tell our viewers the highlights of the mouse results and the clinical relevance? Yeah. Absolutely. So um, for the mouse, we repopulated the immune system, which repopulates the peripheral immune system and also the macrophages of the brain, so called the microglia. And the results in male mice uh, were beyond and above any expectations. As you know, male mice uh, in this particular model live about eight to ten weeks, maybe a little bit beyond that. But our male mice uh, lived for um, many, many, many months. And actually, some of them, our oldest ones, will be celebrating soon their first uh, birthday. But not only the lifespan improved. Uh, what's more, maybe more, more important, or most importantly, is they also were improving the anxiety in their weight, in their overall appearance, and in their breathing uh, as well. This guy will got bone marrow transplantation mm -hmm. and they're now 18 weeks of age. Yep. Well, you can see it's only now at least nine weeks past its expected uh, life. And then it looks, looks good. And then I can show you here. We didn't do here transplantation. Mm -hmm. We just in, in expressed the normal protein only in microglia and macrophages. And so the mice were supposed to be very sick, but they are, as you can see, they are now 30 weeks of age. Mm -hmm. Looks, looks good. So the results in mice look fantastic, but um, as you may know, oh, we are, I mean, many of the mouse diseases uh, we are able to fix. And now, obviously, the major question is how we translate this knowledge into the clinical, into the clinics. When we talk about treatments and cures for Rett syndrome, sometimes we use words interchangeably. Words like reversal, mm -hmm. rescue, arrest, and I think that causes some confusion. So to illustrate, I'll use the, um, the now famous bird reversal experiment, which was published in Science in 2007. In that experiment, um, the bird lab took adult mice, and by reactivating MECP2, they really did get a reversal of practically every symptom. And the male mice went on to live a normal lifespan. I think an, an, another example that we can use is um, the IGF-1 um, paper, which came out in PNAS in 2009. And that really is not a reversal in the same sense of the word. Um, IGF-1 
one treatment was started in male mice when they were two weeks, so it's before they were symptomatic. And um, symptoms were delayed, which is good news, um, but eventually they did come back and the mice still died very prematurely. Um, they, so the lifespan increase was about four to five weeks. So that you can, it's not a reversal, it's a rescue. And it's kind of a temporary rescue of about a month. But I would like to uh, just to emphasize that we're not calling our data, our results uh, a reversal. reversal. Uh, absolutely not. This is probably the arrest yes. or a slowdown or arrest of red symptoms. But arrest for a long time. Which arrest I think for is a long time. Is key. Arrest for a long time. Yeah. You also um, did bone marrow transplantation in pre-symptomatic animals. Right. Uh, in male mice, mice, you did it at four weeks. In female mice, two months. And you were able in male mice to really, ex as you meant, have mentioned a couple of times, to extend lifespan dramatically by a year. So Yanni, can you t talk to us a little bit about um, the decision as to the timing of when to do the transplant? Yeah, you know, it's actually it's a pretty interesting question. Uh, the decision was we wanted to hit the, the, the immune system before the, it's too late, because it takes about four weeks for the immune system to get re uh, reconstituted, and then about another couple of weeks. Uh, for microglia to get engrafted. If the cells have not enough time to get into the brain, we just, the, the, the disease wins. Therefore, we started at uh, four weeks of age. We actually have another experiment in that paper where we start uh, later about six and a half, seven weeks of age where the mice are very, very, very sick. And interestingly, we do extend their lifespan. But the problem is that the mice still die pretty young because it probably, the time point for microglia incorporation or engraftment uh, takes fa go, goes slower than the disease. With female mice, we, we absolutely we could have started way later than two months, so, and we're now actually doing experiments where we do transplantation after the disease is already So once there. the females once are females symptomatic. Are yeah, absolutely. And so can we, you share anything about? Well, I think it's too, too early yet, okay. but, but we are, we, we're really hoping that we will have some data uh, sometime, sometime soon. Okay. So let's dig into the data a little bit. Sure. So apart from the very clinical um, relevance uh, of your findings, you've also made some very significant discoveries about the molecular underpinnings of MECP2. So um, Noah, perhaps you can start us off by telling us a bit about your results. Sure. The angle that we, we were sort of uh, approaching this from in the beginning was the immune system being able to boost uh, uh, BDNF production in the, uh, the central nervous system. Uh, I, think it was a, I think it was a big surprise to us that when we perform our uh, uh, bone marrow uh, transplantations, uh, we don't just replace the, the uh, immune system that's, that's in the body. It turns out that we are also able to replace a number of the immune cells that uh, are, are in the brain. So, it seems that we're able to help the other cells that are, that are hard at work there, the neurons, um, uh, the glia, which uh, were shown uh, very recently to be important in, in Rett syndrome, to work better. Jim, you had some very interesting findings about a process called phagocytosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Perhaps right. you can tell our audience what that is. And sure, sure, yeah. So uh, phagocytosis is the process by which uh, cells in the body, typically immune cells is the way it's thought of, uh, actually either eat invading bacteria or, or just clean up debris and dead cells from normal processes in the body. Um, and so, you know, we thought, well, what could microglia be doing in the brain that might be so beneficial beyond just, uh, you know, supporting the neurons, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the, their primary jobs is to phagocytose things. So if a cell dies, um, something needs to clean all that stuff up. And so typically it's thought of as microglia being the primary cell type in the brain that does that. And so if you don't have, you know, a cell that's doing this efficiently, that's actually really toxic to uh, all the cells uh, in that tissue and can cause more damage. And um, so, so that's sort of one, one of the components that we think we might be affecting here. One of the hypotheses that you put forth in the paper is that um, the delay in symptoms that we see in children with Rett syndrome, they have a typic fairly typical first year of life, you think that perhaps that might be due to the accumulation of debris. I found that really intriguing. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it's certainly possible. It's, it's difficult uh, in our models that we've been working with to show that because it's a little bit different, obviously, Rett syndromes in girls, and they live uh, quite a long time compared to the mice that we're working with. But yes, it's, it's certainly one hypothesis we think could be the case. Are there drugs that we know of that boost um, phagocytosis? I'm really hopeful that we will be able to find molecules that could actually increase phagocytic activity of microglia. And remember, in red girls, half of their immune system, uh, or half of their, all of the cells, at least half, is normal. So if we find ways to boost those cells, and they we're currently testing, actually, that's the GIMS project, we're testing currently a couple of small molecule drugs. Uh, that would hopefully boost phagocytic activity of immune cells and their overall immune activity actually not also testing another, another molecule. But on the molecular level, how things are really working, I think we are far from understanding the, the, the entire process. And that's what we're doing now, that's what keeps us busy. We're trying to understand how things really work. So your work that you've published in, in Rett syndrome, do you think that that has implications for other diseases? Perhaps autism? perhaps the MECP2 duplication syndrome? We are very helpful actually. Jim is now trying to look into duplication mice and see if uh, they also have impaired microglia function. And bone marrow transplantation and microglia boost or boost of the innate immune cells have been shown to be efficient in uh, some types of CNS injury. It's been shown to be efficient in OCD and some other neurological disorders. So and now we show pretty compelling evidence that it works in rats, so hopefully, you know, we're actually thinking maybe even Fragile X and other disorders could benefit from a similar approach, uh, approach absolutely. Yeah. So the next logical question is really developing a treatment protocol for individuals with Rett syndrome. Bone marrow transplant, as we've touched on, is a very serious procedure mm -hmm. and one that should not be entered into lightly. Mm -hmm. As you know, um, RSRT has already started the process of a very, very thorough exploration with clinicians who specialize in transplantation. You've all participated in those discussions and will continue to do so. I think a very crucial step in that process is an independent confirmation of your findings in a second lab. So on behalf of uh, families everywhere who love a child with Rett syndrome, I want to thank you for your creative and really innovative work. You've opened up a potential new door for treating Rett syndrome, and for that, I, and I'm sure every family that listens to this, um, is really grateful. Um, as we've heard, there's a lot of work to be done, so your, your, your lab bench work continues. But I suspect that this paper in Nature um, is not going to be your last major contribution to Rett syndrome research? I think the mo very important thing to understand for, our, uh, for those who listen to us is that there is no major discovery that is being made in vacuum. Everything is being, it's, it's all being built on. built on what other people have done. I think without, the, obviously, the discovery of the gene by Huda Zogby, we wouldn't be anywhere where we are. Without the mice made by Huda Zogby and by Adrian Bird and uh, Rudolf Jenisch, we wouldn't be anywhere. And then recent discoveries by the Gehman and Delgrag lab that actually astrocytes are playing a role as well in the, in, in, in the, in the Red Syndrome. And I wish other researchers in other fields and other diseases would have been as generous. collaborative, as generous mm -hmm. as, as those in, in the Red Field. Absolutely. Yes, I think we are lucky in that. We are absolutely, absolutely. I wish you a lot of success and Godspeed, and uh, we look forward to keeping our viewers um, up to date on your developments. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, Monica, uh, the families, and particularly RSRT, and you as well. I mean, probably you m more than anybody else for our continue for your continuous support. And without RSRT, without your involvement, and I mean, we wouldn't be anywhere close where we are.